so my name is uh, Carl. Uh, I work for a company called Optiva, which is a global uh, electronic market maker. Um, I'll discuss a little bit more about that in the talk. The talk is really about how we, um, in general, I think, at trading companies, develop uh, order trading systems in C++ uh, that are basically as fast as you can possibly make them uh, go. And I don't want that to sound like an exaggeration, but really there's competitors who are doing this um, just as fast as you. So that last little bit of speed uh, basically makes a difference between um, a successful system and an unsuccessful system. So what we're going to talk about today is just when I say fast, I'll tell you exactly how fast I actually mean. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of C++ in automated trading systems. It's actually a small part of an automated trading system. C++ isn't the be-all and end-all of uh, high-frequency trading. It's certainly important, but there's a lot of other things that go into it as well. Uh, the majority of the talk will be on uh, low latency C++ techniques, so little tricks that we use. Um, there's lots more than the 10 or so that I'm going to show, but it's really just to give you an insight into how you program low latency software. Um, if we have time, hopefully we, we will, I'll talk a little bit about the downsides of C++. There are some. Um, and then that leads into SG14 and how SG14 is helping us out now and in the future. A little bit about me. I've got an uh, academic background, um, mainly in computer science. I've spent about 10 years writing uh, auto trading systems, or at least systems within the financial sector, mainly on order entry. So basically trying to get messages to the exchange as fast as possible to insert an order, or maybe delete an order, or something else along those lines. I'm a member of uh, SG14. We've got Michael, we've got Guy, and maybe a couple of others in the audience today. Um, and I represent the trading side of SG14. It's voluntary, no one voted me in. But I'm basically the only, well, one of the few um, active members of the trading industry in SG14. So I try to push things along to be aligned with uh, high frequency trading as much as I can. And that naturally has an overlap between games development and other low latency development, such as signal processing uh, and those sorts of things. Um, this isn't a talk on. Uh, general performance. Uh, low latency performance is quite different to general performance, which is often more about high uh, throughput, so maybe rendering at 60 frames a second on relatively low spec hardware. Uh, this is more about just trying to squeeze the last few nanoseconds um, out of your system. So uh, yeah, if you want to see a talk, you know, good talks on just general performance, uh, there's definitely a lot um, of good talks out there. Um, I've also removed some of the overlap from my slides yesterday because sitting in the presentations yesterday, there was already quite a fair bit covered by other people. So just deleted those slides. Hopefully, it'll give us some more time at the end. So as a motivating example of what a training company might do, uh, let's go back to what we might do if we want to go on holiday in the UK. We've got some euros in our pocket. We want to convert them to pounds. And these were the currency rates about 10 days ago, and they've completely changed since then because a few things have happened. But let's go with this example. So you go to your bank or you go to your online brokerage, and you take your euro, and you'll get 90 Great British pence back. OK, great. But you might look at some other rates. And there's euro to US dollar. There's US dollar to Great British pounds. Well, if you did both conversions, euros to US, US to Great British pounds, that uh, works out at 90 pence, which makes sense. If, it, if that equation didn't hold, there would be money to be made. So for example, say if the euro to US went up to 1.2 as opposed to 1.1, the other prices stayed as they were, well, you could make free money. You could convert from euros to US dollars, from US dollars to Great British pence, and then if you wanted to, you can convert straight back to pounds, no, sorry, to euros, and you'd have a free 10%, just like that. Do that a million times in a row worth $1,000 a time, you'd be um, pretty rich. The reason why this opportunity won't exist, well, basically doesn't exist, and if it did, it wouldn't exist for very long, is there are trading companies making sure that these prices are in line, and if they're not, they'll bring them back into line pretty quickly. Of course, we're all competing with each other, and so the fastest systems 
will make the most money. This seems somewhat aggressive, but another way of looking at it is trading companies will also quote, they'll provide prices. Um, so they're willing to say, okay, I'm willing to exchange for this particular rate. However, if something happens, maybe some news comes in or there's a currency announcement, you might want to adjust your quotes very, very quickly to not get run over by someone else. Um, so it's not just being aggressive, but it's also being very fast to adjust or possibly uh, remove yourself from the market for a few seconds while things settle down. So it's not just about speed to make money, it's about speed to not lose money as well. So yeah, as I said, the fastest wins. Um, it really doesn't matter by how much. I'm not even sure who wins in this situation. I've tried to look it up. But really, it doesn't matter if you're fastest by a minute or a nanosecond. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a relative difference which counts. So I said I was going to talk about how fast is actually fast. Well, for any sort of transaction, there's at least a few basic things that you need to do. So you need to be looking at an exchange, an electronic exchange, which is feeding you prices. It's telling you, in the case of currencies, what a currency is doing. So you're receiving packets in. Uh, it could be a million packets a second on a busy exchange. And you're looking at all of this. OK, currencies can go up or down or stay the same. So from reading that market data, taking it off the network, maybe a system call there, parsing it, uh, validating that this actually makes sense, through to spotting the opportunity. Hey, the US to, no, sorry, the euro to US has ticked up from 1.1 to 1.2. That looks really good to us. We want to um, shoot in an order through to performing some risk checks with this bankrupt. If we did this, if does this look like a sensible kind of thing to do, um, to actually formatting the message, the order that we want to send to the exchange, transmitting that on the network. So an, an all software approach, a good all software approach, I mean, no one's going to give you exact figures, um, and it varies even within companies, but if you read on the internet, people will typically say around about one micro to 10 micros, say maybe an average of five micros, to do all of that, which is quite fast. Um, a hardware approach, if you went, OK, this trading strategy works, let's just get rid of C++, let's pretty much get rid of the operating system, let's do everything on um, either an FPGA or possibly a printed card, might take as little as um, 100 nanoseconds. That's what some people claim. Um, I'd say it's quite possible, quite frankly. Boris, <laughs> Um, so this is the distance of light in one microsecond. So if you're talking a tenth of a microsecond, sorry, a um, hundredth, so, sorry, a millionth, a hundred nanoseconds, a hundredth. Um, uh, just think about that for a second. That's at nighttime standing at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower, shining up a flashlight. By the time someone at the observing platform at the top of the Eiffel Tower has seen that flashlight, turn on. You could have potentially sent 10 orders if this was in hardware. It's, it's, it's just mind-boggling fast. And now when we think about mistakes and how long it takes us to react to mistakes, like, whoops, we loaded the wrong rates. We were off. I mean, how many orders can you um, send in like a few seconds before, you know, some panic button goes off and you receive an email saying, hey, it doesn't quite look right. Um, very little time to react, even with an old software approach. You can still do a lot of damage in a handful of microseconds if you only realize five minutes later that something's gone wrong. Um, this does, unfortunately, bankrupt companies. Even worse, it's, well, with mistakes, it can bankrupt companies. Even worse, it can um, devalue the share market. People can lose money. Um, it can put the market into panic if you do things wrong. So it's very, very highly regulated. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, visibility if you do things wrong, uh, lots of regulation. So um, it's not just a case of being fast, because it's very easy to be really, really fast. It's very easy. You can bend the rules. You can do all sorts of things. But um, these days, you just can't do that. You have to play by the rules. You um, have to show that your risk, your risk measurements are in, in check. You're not doing anything. Um, to sort of um, dirty in terms of um, 
technical tricks. You know, you have to effectively play by the same rule book as everyone else, which is fair enough. Okay, so we're going to jump into some code um, pretty soon, but I thought I'd just try to briefly characterize what low latency systems are really all about. Um, lots of code, um, potentially millions of lines of code, but really it's only a handful of lines of code that actually do anything, which is the, hey, there's an order I want to, well, there's something that looks good, I'm going to generate an order, I'm going to submit it to the exchange. And that's quite weird. It's something like 0.1% of your code base is actually the thing that counts. Everything else doesn't count. Yeah, you do need it, but it's you know, doing some sort of out-of-bound risk checks or listening to various other pieces of network data that really don't matter that much um, in the grand concept of, or the grand scheme of things. Um, so yeah, that's, it's very strange to have all of this code, but knowing that really only one, one code path is the thing that you care about. Um, these lines are not lines of code are not exercised really all that often. If, again, if you compare it to games, you're you know, maybe 50, 60, 30 times a second, uh, effectively running rendering or you know, a whole bunch of code. Yeah, there's lots of market data coming in, potentially millions of lines, uh, sorry, millions of messages a second. But most of those market data events are not interesting. It's, yeah, only a few events per second are, are actually worth, generally are worth um, doing something with. So most of the time, all you're doing is stopping very, very early in your, what, what I would call a hot path, in your hot path. Most of the time, it's like not interested, not interested, once or twice a second. Yeah, okay, now we're interested. Um, Jitter is a real killer, so it's really good to be fast, but not if you're fast with a large standard deviation. Because when you think about trying to pull orders, if you can pull four out of five orders really fast, but that fifth order you can't pull at all because for whatever reason your code um, ends up being slowed down by an interrupt or something like that, trust me, there's going to be someone in the market who's going to take that, that bad order out. So Jitter is, is just not acceptable. Uh, a little bit different from, say, uh, video encoding, where maybe a little bit of jitter from time to time is acceptable. It's going to cost you um, if you have it in low latency trading systems. Um, the code's incredibly simple as well. Not really much vectorization, not much threading. Um, it's, yeah, generally very straightforward code. It just needs to be fast. Now, yeah, there can be some mathematical models that will all sorts of crazy quantitative stuff and complex computations, but that's not necessarily the hot path. That's more just trying to formulate a general idea of where we want to go. Um, yeah, the actual fast path is really um, genuinely simple, and it needs to be. Okay, so I said before that C++ is um, part of a high-frequency trading system. Really, it's based upon um, fast networks. This is not a fast network, but um, it should be no secret that high-frequency trading companies use microwaves. Why would you use microwaves as opposed to fiber optic cables? Latency, yeah, slightly faster, slightly less latency, slightly faster to the speed of light than fiber optic cables. You'll see this, every high-frequency company has microwave towers everywhere. And it's no secret. You can look at land registries. You'll, you'll see high-frequency trading companies as the owners of these things. And it makes sense. Um, if you don't have a fast network, I mean, a fast network, <clears throat> without a fast network, you could be looking at milliseconds to um, receive data. That's just no good. That's just not going to work. Um, I need some decent server hardware. Again, it's probably not going to cut it. Um, and again, this isn't terribly difficult. Go out and buy some decent servers. Um, yeah, that's more or less it. Buy good servers, high spec. But tune them. Um, you need people who know what they're doing in terms of tuning the BIOS, um, thermal headroom, all of those sorts of things. And also the um, operating system needs a fair bit of tuning as well getting rid of interrupts, CPU isolation, uh, process isolation, um, all of those th sorts of things. So, yeah, um, without that, you're, again, you're, you're going to have quite a fair bit of jitter. Things are just going to be slower. 
Finally, C++. Grab yourself a book, learn C++ in 24 hours. Um, that's where we are. And then, of course, you need your uh, trading algorithms as well. Um, and there's a bit of a misconception that the trading algorithms are super complicated, and that's where the intellectual property of the company is, and uh, maybe it is to a degree. But, but it's not hard. There's textbooks which tell you how to price options, and that's typically what companies use, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, again, it, seriously, it's not that complicated. The source code is in the back of most of the textbooks anyway. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. The kernel tuning, the server, hardware, the networks, really, really interesting topic. Really enjoy that side of my job. Um, we're not going to talk about it today. Again, it's a C++ conference. Um, but if you want to chat to me afterwards, or um, I've got a few other uh, colleagues floating around at the conference, yeah, come, come chat with us. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, when you get your network card, when you get your network switch, when you get your network, when you get your servers, when you get your operating system, that designed for throughput. Let's run a print server and an LDAP server and an email server all on the same box. And you can also log into it with X Windows, and you can, and, and it works really, really well. But that's not so good for uh, high frequency trading. We want um, one server to pretty much do one thing and one thing well. So you're fighting what these systems are designed for all the way through, which is fine. It's fun, but. OK, so I mentioned that we need tuned servers. So here's a rather uh, non-scientific um, experiment that I did uh, about a week ago, where I took a options pricing model, which is about 10 lines of code. It has very little in the way of data access. It's just a few constants to approximate a normal distribution and priced a series of options. Uh, it's instruction intensive. Ran the same computation twice, once on a tuned server, once on the same server, but untuned. Uh, the tuned is gray, the untuned is red. And there's just a clear, slight edge that you get. But again, remember back to that slide of the cycle race, it doesn't matter how fast you are, as long as you're the fastest. And you get this for free. As a C++ developer at a trading company, you've got a whole bunch of people who are tuning the servers, who are making sure the networks are good, so you've already got an immediate advantage. Uh, the way of saying it is that if you don't have, or if you don't pay attention to your servers, you don't tune them, you don't tune your operating system. By default, you're going to have this uh, mode, which is more for fair sharing and high throughput, which is not actually what you want in terms of speed. So before we go into the code, I think this is the last uh, slide before we go into the code, actually. Um, I tried to break this down into three different categories. I think it holds. Um, so we've got smartness, we've got implementation, and we've got specifics as well. So in smartness, um, a lot of the um, techniques that I see time and time again is problem transformation. So not effectively not doing the following. I'm going to do absolutely nothing until I see market data come in. And then when it comes in, we're going to have a look at it. Did the price go up? No, the price went down. OK, let's run a computation on that. Great, we've got a computation. I think we should sell. OK, let's sell. What do we need to do to sell? Ah, we need to do some risk checks. OK, we'll go do those. Now we need to form a network packet. Let's send it. Did I win? No. Um, it really, just transforming this problem, a uh, price is either going to go up, it's going to stay the same, or it's going to go down. So you know that. And you basically know what code paths you're going to um, uh, run down, given one of those three events. So you can pre-compute. You can pre-compute so much, and then just wait for these events to happen. Again, it's a little bit like being an optimizing compiler, but for the actual uh, trading problem as opposed to the source code. So it's really just thinking about things slightly differently and trying to be one step ahead of what's actually happening at runtime. Then move your decisions from runtime to compile time. We've heard this um, a lot already. Um, uh, Bjarne, was talking about this on basically slide three um, of the keynote. You know, use static assert, use constant expression. These things, anything that you can move out of the runtime has to help. Excuse me. Another thing, heuristics are, are completely acceptable in some cases. 
if you're close to a risk limit, um, and you might go over it, and it's an expensive computation to figure that out, just set your, your risk limits. Easy, move on. Um, so yeah, lots of things don't require expensive precision. Lots of things you can use heuristics and get quite a long way. Implementation. Um, last year at meeting CPP, Chandler gave a talk on um, effectively optimizing compilers or optimizing within Clang, at least. And he was saying exactly this. The simpler the code, faster it's likely to be. And it's true. These optimizations that you think you're making can often just mean that the compiler can't fully optimize your code. So yeah, aim for simple code. Um, I've got a slide on this later. Don't underestimate optimizing compilers. They're um, generally smarter than you. 99 times out of 100, they'll, they'll do the right thing. Be really familiar with the language, in this case, C++. I mean, if you want the um, third largest value from a sorted list, don't sort the list, call nth largest. Um, the, the more you know about your library, the more you know about the way that the language works, the better it's going to be. Talk yesterday, know your hardware, it's true. It, it really is, and these um, patterns that we saw yesterday in terms of you know, what happens if you go over a particular cache or branch prediction, um, uh, cache collisions, it's true, and you'll see this. You'll see this time and time again, and so knowing, seeing a symptom and knowing effectively what that might map to is really helpful to avoid that and speed up your code. Bypass the operating system. The operating system is for um, doing nice word processing, writing to files, making sure that everything is fair. We don't want that. Bypass it. You do not want the operating system. It's going to be there from time to time, sure. But generally speaking, you want 100% user space code. More on that later. Um, most importantly, measure, measure, measure. Don't guess. Profiling is only going to get you so far. Measure, have a look. Have a look at what the actual speed is of your code in a production setup, not in a micro benchmark in production. Um, for the specifics, read the assembly. I can't write a line of assembly to save myself. I cannot write hello world in assembly. But I can read it. I can see that this is a move instruction. You know, I can see that this is a jump. Jumps are bad. Um, the more that you can read, the more that you can understand what your compiler is doing, what happens if you change a compiler flag, what happens if you change your code. Um, generally speaking, fewer instructions, faster the code, generally. Um, and a little trick that every company I know pulls as well is at the moment there's zero control, well, within C++ at least, there's zero control over your cache. You read data, it goes into your cache. You write data, it gets written through your cache. The problem is cache eviction, and that hurts. So you might um, go, right, we want to send an order. I'll quickly go look up the um, information that I need to tell the exchange again. And it's gone from your cache. So you have this massive cache hit. It can cost you um, uh, potentially milliseconds, uh, milli potentially microseconds. Um, so the need, uh, effectively, just if you know that you're going to refer to some data, you know that it's going to get evicted from the cache because that's what operating systems and hardware does. Just keep on effectively writing and reading that data. Keep on calling that function. Just keep that function and that data warm. It'll give you a, I mean, it can give us a five uh, microsecond speed up just doing that, keeping your cache hot. One thing that I'd love out of C++, and I think it's a future direction for SG14 as well, is actual C++ control over your cache. Lock the cache. No one touches this cache. I write to it. I read from it. I'll take care of it. It would save a lot of um, code. Um, if anyone's used HTOP, the top two processes here, um, two and three, are good. It's all green. System calls. The third one, process four, bad. Half of the time in um, user space. Sorry if I said, yeah, no system calls. Half the time in user space, half the time in system calls. What's it doing? Probably polling a socket. Maybe writing to disk, who knows. But that's not what, what you want to see. Also, you don't want to see any swap. Swaps, swap slow, just buy more memory, effectively. Now, that, that is um, really, really different from, um, say, games programming, where you're restricted to a console. You can't just buy more memory, or you, know, you can't migrate to more CPUs. But um, within trading, it's really quite different. Buy more servers if you're trading too many um, 
stocks for your program to handle by another service, split the number of stocks onto two machines. I mean, it's really, there's just so much you can go in certain directions that are a little bit harder. You can't <clears throat> tell your customers, you know, to go buy two gaming consoles instead of one. I'm pretty sure that doesn't fly. Okay, some general considerations. So this is um, what I wiped out of my slides. Um, basically, I think everyone's seen this in the last few years anyway. Move semantics, static assert, uh, data member layout to reorder your, your fields within structures to be more friendly, to possibly squeeze more into a cache line or not overflow cache lines. Um, aligners, watching out for false sharing, cache locality, these are all super important. Um, no time today to spend on it, but plenty of other presentations to talk about that. I will say, definitely true. So this is a um, classic example. It's old, 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 but I've run it on very new hardware. And this is C++ sort, standard sort, versus CQ sort. And in the blue green, you can see the timing difference. So four times as slow if we use Q sort. And the standard deviation is actually even worse, which is the thing that you're worried about mainly. Um, why? It's just inlining, the compiler knows. With the standard sort, the compiler knows exactly what you're doing, it knows what your intentions are. It can inline all of that. Unfortunately, you can't inline with QSort, it doesn't know exactly what's going on. It's function calls, massive difference. Um, how did I get these results and other results? I use um, Google Benchmark, it's really good for micro benchmarking. So I just said don't micro benchmark, but if you're going to, um, do check out Google Benchmark. It's a really, really cool tool. Really nice. Makes, makes benchmarking nice and easy. A little bit more on that later on. Okay, it's um, going to be really hard to read, but that's okay. Can anyone read that? Front row can read it. Good news. Two rows back can't. Okay, that's fine. Um, the point I want to make about const expression here is const expression is great. So um, this is a very poor implementation of power function that only takes um, integrals as the base. Um, has some nice static asserts, so to tell you if you've passed in the wrong data, but most importantly, it's a const expression. I, that there. It's a const expression. We'll call it raise four to the power of eight. Move that familiar number, and that's it. Um, this would be branching and all sorts of horrible things, probably, uh, if it wasn't const expression. So, I mean, this is just a clear win. Like, const expression is absolutely great. Yeah, you can do it in other ways. You could preprocess it, which writes a table of values or things like that. But const expression just makes life easier. And it's faster than uh, templates. Your compile time should be faster using const expression. So, variadic templates, another C11 um, gem. This is um, probably about four slides of code. This is the most, well, this is the largest number of slides of code I'm going to show in any one shot. But this is what we do uh, after very, uh, you can also see similar examples on the internet if you search for this, but we've done it in a slightly more um, low latency way, I guess. Um, I've got a couple of links to GitHub repos of me and one of my colleagues. We've both got our own at home implementation, so you can have a look there yeah, afterwards. But this is going to log for us. So if we look at main, we're going to call log. I'm passing in an integer, a char, a float. Let's run the program. It works. But you'll notice a couple of things there. Um, we're not specifying the types of the arguments that we're passing in. Don't need to. Um, and also the disassembly, slightly more to it than this, but basically it boils down to three moves one for each thing that we want to log. What we're doing is we're not really logging there, we're writing into memory there. So in the hot path, you really don't want to be writing to a log file, write into memory somewhere. Later on, when times are quiet, log it back out, log it in a different thread, push it into some queue somewhere. Um, but the, that previous line of code actually did quite a lot. It did argument checking at compile time. It went, do the number of placeholders, well, A, I'm going to count the number of placeholders. B, do they match the number of arguments that we've passed in? Um, C, it's going to write. Um, okay, at runtime, it's going to write those values. 
into memory, but also at compile time, it's going to generate types which know how to write at runtime into memory and also know how to read those types back out or those values back out of memory and actually format them nicely again based on the format string. So again, that is, that is quite powerful to have a function like that that is basically one move per thing that you log, plus argument checking at compile time um, and all of those good things. And no need to specify percent %s or percent %d or whatever. So a few lines of code here. Um, so here's the log macro, just for convenience. So we've got a function there, count placeholders, make sure that the count of the placeholders is equivalent to the size of the arguments, i.e. the size of the variadic list. Um, if that all looks good, we get past our static assert, and then we can actually write to the log. It's not really writing to the log, it's writing to just a buffer somewhere. Count placeholders, it's fairly straightforward, it's just running through, again, not a great implementation, but it's just running through counting the number of placeholders that it sees in the string. Um, and then size of args has just been tweaked slightly so that it works within a macro, but we'll give you the list of, sorry, it'll give you the number of arguments in a variadic list. Write log, again, I won't give the implementation details of this that don't really count, but you can just go have a look on GitHub for this, on the links coming up. Um, but we need a buffer, and we need a buffer that's big enough to store those arguments. Once we've got that, uh, copy the arguments into that buffer. And copy args, it should be a fairly um, familiar pattern, I hope. Uh, oh, I was going to use a pointer, but I won't, won't bother. Um, copy a single arc, and then compile time recurse. I don't know if you can call it that, but that's what I'm going to call it. And the base case, when you have no arguments left to parse, just return the buffer um, as is. What does copy arg, the main thing about this actually do? Sorry to disappoint you, it's incredibly boring. It's just the move. Reinterpret, cast. And effectively assign to whatever that value was. That's only going to work for trivially copyable arguments. If something has a non-trivial copy constructor, we need an additional specialization of that function. But that's all right. I'm You'll see, uh, I think, I think maybe on these GitHub examples, we might have done that, but if not, it's effectively the same code, um, just specialized for different types. Um, and they're also not much more expensive to memory copy either. Like if you copy a string, for example, it's, it's not that expensive. Yeah, so it's a really nice example of using um, C++11, C++14 uh, to give you really just quite a nice speed up. Yeah, there's other ways of doing fast logging, but this is really, um, I think, quite a nice way of doing it. The implementation, Ah, okay, it's not trivial, um, but it's really powerful. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, loop unrolling. Don't do it. Compilers are really, really, really smart. Um, lots of compilers say, please don't loop unroll, because if you manually do this, we can't make optimizations. So here's a um, silly example that I just want to prove how good compilers are. So here's um, a loop that's going to go through 26 times the 26 instead of 25, because the compiler knows another little trick with the magic number 25. 26, if the argc happens to be less than 10, then we're going to increase count from 0 to argc. Um, well, basically increase the count by argc each time. Otherwise, if it's uh, greater than 10, we're going to decrease argc by that. So we need to have a positive number or a negative number by the time we finish up. The compiler goes right. We're either going to take positive 10 or negative 10, uh, multiply it by 26, and we're done. I mean, this is just how smart compilers are. That's it. No loop, um, no jump, no branch, just a conditional move in there. So when you think, ah, I can make this faster, mm, have a look at what the compiler's done first. It may have, it may have figured it out. It probably has. Um, <clears throat> now, just to directly contradict what I just said, um, you should short circuit where you can. So if you have an expensive check followed by an inexpensive check, flip them around. Stop processing as soon as you possibly can. If you saw this in code, you'd probably go, ah, oh, yeah, look at that, I can change it. 
It's not always obvious, but do critique your code. Have a look, see if these opportunities are there. Often they are there. Um, another uh, interesting tip that I guess is that um, there's no such thing as overflow for signed integers. There is for unsigned integers, according to the standard. So the compiler can make some pretty interesting assumptions here. So this loop, you have to steer at it quite carefully, but um, it's basically going to go through and well, iterate 10 times. It's going to increase the counter by one each time and then return the counter. So not surprisingly, uh, it's basically going to return 10. If you can see that move instruction on the right hand side, push 10 into a register and return because that's really all the program's doing. Now, if we change that to unsigned, all of a sudden, the compiler's got to make some assumptions. Well, it, yeah, the opposite actually. It can't make assumptions that it was making before. Now it has to check for overflow. Um, so now it actually has to check and see if that value would overflow, and if it would overflow, maybe you just have to trust me on this, this will return zero, because that loop can never um, be entered because the overflow would bring the value that it's checking back down to zero, which would be greater than the initial value. So you can see there's actually a lot more work to be done there in main. Um, it's actually doing a comparison to figure out if it did overflow or not, and either returning zero or 10. All because someone changed something from signed to unsigned. Okay. Just something to yeah, keep in mind, watch out for. Again, just have a look at the assembly from time to time, see what's going on. Mixing floats and doubles. What is the data type 1.23? Is it a float or is it a double? Yeah, it's a double. So if you look at the disassembly, which I'm not going to show, or the assembly, um, you'll see that there's a conversion there. There's extra instructions um, if you have your literals as um, doubles, but you're actually using floats. So unless you really need to, don't mix floats and doubles. Um, if fast math is a topic for a different talk altogether, one that I'm not capable of giving, but if you're feeling brave, enable that. See what sort of speed up you get. See what sort of unexpected behavior you get. Um, this has been a topic of great debate, actually, within SG14, whether or not these primitives such as built and expect on GCC do any good or not. Um, the point that I want to make is that the hardware branch predictor is really unbelievably good. And all of these hints are for the compiler. The compiler hints are for the compiler. They're not for the hardware. Um, the, uh, so yeah, basically when you're programming the way that we program, we're constantly trying to trick the hardware into thinking that it's continually sending orders. We're not, but then when that one order comes through that we do want to send, then hopefully everything's in cache and we're good to go. One other positive benefit of that is a hardware branch predictor has a pretty good idea that if you've tried to send an order a million times in the last half a second, you're probably going to send an order again. So you get limited gains, I think, with these um, compiler hints. But there are some exceptions to it. Yeah, it might reorder your functions or your code in a slightly different way. It might reorder your data in a different way. And for functions that are called very rarely, so the branch predictor doesn't have any information, but when those functions are called, you want them to take the correct paths, yeah, then it can kind of help, I think. Uh, if you could only do one thing, if you're only allowed to do one thing, then yeah, definitely use those compiler hints. They, they will help if it's the very, if the only thing that you have time to do. But over time, I think you'll get diminishing returns. So on the left-hand side here, we've got, um, some code. It's checking for an error condition, and then it's checking for another error condition, and then it's checking for another. And then we're um, executing the hot path. Not so fast. That's not great. Um, let's do it another way. Anytime an error condition pops up, remember, record it in that same flag. Don't have data all over the place. Have it in one place. Then when it comes to the hot path, just check once. If there's an error, OK. We're not going any further. Uh, otherwise, off we go. Your code will be faster. It's really last point. 
is um, I find really interesting, or don't have any error control at all. Have an object which knows how to run the hot path, and if anything bad happens before that time, tear that object down. That object's gone. So, different way of thinking about it. Exceptions. Exceptions do not slow down your code. Yeah, I said it. I've timed it. I've timed it a lot. They do not slow down your code. OK, you might need to catch an exception. Yeah, it gets expensive. If you're um, squeezed in terms of you only have a certain amount of memory for your instructions, you're on restricted hardware, I don't know. Probably it might slow down. Don't have a clue. But for a server, high frequency trading server, zero difference with you whether you have exceptions enabled or not. Exceptions are quite nice in some respects. Have a serious error, just blow that function out of the way, handle it somewhere, shut down, go back to the start, whatever. Um, but yeah, really, yeah, they're not, they're not slow. Oh. A little bit hard to measure because to disable exceptions, you change your control path. Yeah. Uh, another point here, related to a couple of slides ago. Um, okay, so we're in the hot path. Things look good. Let's go. Otherwise, things look bad. Let's do X. Let's do Y. Let's do Z. Don't do that. Move it out. Put it into a separate method. No one line it. Get it as far away from those instructions as you can. It will make a difference. Um, yeah, so I mean, I usually use GCC, a little bit of Clang, so most of these examples are GCC. Um, but yeah, no online can actually be um, quite useful. You'll hear this all over the place. Keep your functions that are used together together, keep your data that's used together together, keep everything else separate. It's really true. It's really true. Allocations, uh, delete is expensive. New is really expensive, so you don't want to be doing that in the hot path. Have your own memory pools. Um, have a memory pool for orders, a memory pool for market data, a memory pool for logic objects. Um, allocate heaps of memory at startup. Never let go of it. Don't disrupt it. There's no need. The program's going to shut at 6 o'clock each night. It'll be fine. If you run out of memory, buy more. Um, <laughs> OK, so you can't just use a huge amount of memory and cache and thrash, but it really is basically that simple. Just buy more, or use a different server, or use a new server, or use two servers. Um, again, coming back to SG14, um, standard vector is really good. Um, avoid map. Um, unordered map these days is OK. But wherever you can, use a vector. Don't do lookups. Just store your data in contiguous arrays. Um, again, keep related data together, keep other data away. <laughs> Nothing wrong with denormalizing data. So um, you won't read this in your software engineering textbooks, but copy your data. Memory's cheap, copy it. Yeah, it's a hassle. You might have out of date versions here or there, or you might have bugs. <coughs> but why look up if you don't need to? If there's no serious cost to copying something so you don't need to look it up, <coughs> copy it. Um, this is a really interesting data structure to look at. This is quite similar to what we use, uh, Optiva, actually. Um, but yeah, basically a hash table that um, keeps everything in contiguous memory. Uh, and you can potentially yeah, keep your data out of the hash table and just have pointers to your data, because look, <laughs> lookup is expensive. When you're running through, trying to figure out where is that damn thing, that's expensive. That's thrashing your cache. Yeah. So if you can be doing small lookups as opposed to massive lookups, can make a difference depending on what you're doing. OK, very finally, and I think well, very finally for this section, um, and then we've got one section to go after that, um, is I, I absolutely love Lambda functions. Um, I, yeah, they've just made my life a lot better, a lot easier. So he, here's an uh, example of a Lambda function, where on the left we've got a method which coincidentally takes a lambda function in, it invokes a lambda, lambda function, I, the call to target on the left-hand side here, and then it sends. 
And on the right hand side, we're going to call this method. And we're passed in something, don't know what it is, but we've called it message. So there's a bit of a clue. We're going to populate that message, and then that's it. Now, going back to the left hand side, send a message. We've got this thing called m buffer over here. So that could be DMA memory on a network card, which we pass to the caller, and then we're writing directly to the network card, populating it, and then we flip a bit on the network card to say, send whatever's in your buffer, and off you go. No libraries, no special stuff from the API point of view. It's super clean, but this is opaque. This could be anything, and it really could be um, writing directly to hardware at this point, and you don't know. And that's great that you don't know. Um, so yeah, you can just do some super cool stuff. By the way, that's in mind. No function calls, no anything. It's just move instructions. <coughs> Excuse me. Surprises and side notes. Um, uh, probably quite a few of you know this, but I did a recent benchmark just to see how bad this was. GCC uh, 5 is a lot faster for strings than GCC 4. Um, so if we look at it, it's twice as fast. Micro benchmark, I know, I'm breaking my own rules, but <clears throat> it's true. So um, GCC 4 had, and 3, had a uh, copy on write semantics for strings. So there's a cost with copying and there's cost with destruction. And there was also some thread safe protection in there as well. So there's some atomics. Um, that's expensive and you can clearly see it. Move to GCC 5 and it's fast again. So yeah, that, that caught me out a little bit. <clears throat> Build and link. Uh, this could be a topic for um, a day's workshop in itself. Um, so let's not go there. But the advice I have is frequently check the disassembly. I know I said check the disassembly, but when you add a new statement to a method, if you just recompile on a different day, you might get a different result. So continue to check. Um, a profile-guided optimization <clears throat> is great if in production you're running exactly the same events as you're running with the profile-guided optimization. If it varies, you might end up with code that's slower than if you hadn't done the PGO at all. So just be careful of overfitting the model in that respect. Uh, static linking can help. Um, there's no reason to not use it, really. I uh, mentioned in a previous talk, actually, I was just in, use debug symbols. There's nothing wrong with using debug symbols in release mode. Uh, again, different if you're on a games console, I'm sure. But it's just a whole bunch of data that sits there, won't go near your cache. But if you get a crash or a core dump or an exception or something, yeah, OK, then you can actually see where you were in your code, what's going wrong. Link time optimization can give you a speed up. It's quite complicated to set up, but it's worth considering. Play around with inlining, play around with your compiler options, particularly the no inline options and the inline depth and all of those things. Yeah, just play around, see what works for you. Um, this, this caught me out uh, the other day, actually. Um, user space networking, uh, the other day, caught me out about six months ago. Um, so user space networking, go grab a SolarFlare card or a Mellanox card or even an Intel card and go grab the user space um, drivers, and you don't need to make system calls anymore for your um, networking, which is great. You can read and write. It's 100% user space. It's very fast. But the problem is that if you get a large number of messages in, you're going to be trampling your cache with a large number of messages. And I had configured user space myself for some data that actually wasn't that important, and all of a sudden my results really started to suffer. And of course, I was just trampling my cache by reading too much of this additional information coming in, which was not pertinent to trading at all. So ended up still using user space, but on a different CPU, distilling the important information out of it, putting that into shared memory, <coughs> just pushing that from time to time to the hot CPU. So yeah, user space is great. It's really important. You need it. But be careful, because it can affect your cache. Concurrency. Um, you don't really get that much from concurrency. Yeah, you get two CPUs, but everything else is shared. Still the same, basically the same cache, the same memory bus, uh, it's the same network, it's the same I/O. Um, so this is my general philosophy for when you start to use multi-threading. 
yeah, you do need it sometimes, but it's, it's not a speed up. It's trying to solve a problem. And it's not good to have the problem in the first place. So I think this is one of the most important slides in the talk, or this and the next slide, which goes into it in a little bit more detail, about measurement. I said measurement, measurement, measurement. I don't mean by profiling. I don't mean by micro benchmarks. I mean by actually measuring in production. Um, without it, you're kind of guessing. Um, so what do we do? Well, the right-hand side here is a server with my code on it. And that's what's going to be doing the work. Uh, the left-hand side is a fake exchange, which is replaying the previous day's market data. And it's also going to be, pretend to be an exchange which will happily accept any order that I happen to send to it. So my system thinks that we're, we're trading. We've got a full system. We've got a switch in the middle, which knows how to timestamp packets. It'll put a timestamp onto the end of the Ethernet frame with very high resolution um, timestamps. So the timestamps won't drift by more than a couple of nanoseconds. And then finally, another server which is going to intercept these packets, parse them, intercept them without cost, by the way, so no slowdown on the network line, parse them, and then match up and have a look and go, OK, I see we sent an order. What was the corresponding packet that triggered that order? Great, I found it. What's the time difference and timestamps between the two? Your system is taking eight microseconds to run, 8.5 microseconds to run. Typically, you'll see noise of about 100, 200 nanoseconds on each run, but that's pretty good. Anything you do in C++, it's going to cost you. And when you change things, it's going to cost you a few hundred nanos here or there. So if you repeatedly see that you're 300 nanos down, sorry, worse, after making that change, you've got a problem. If you're fast, if you're faster, you've probably done something good. Um, and again, it's completely non-destructive, doesn't touch the code, it's, it doesn't have that observer effect, which is great. Yeah, like I say, profiling is good, but um, you're better to just try to observe the actual packets going in and out. You can only do that on a system where all you care about is packets in and out. But if you have that luxury, it's a really nice way of measuring. So the very last couple of slides now. Um, you do pay for what you don't use. It's only a tiny bit. It's a few hundred nanoseconds here or there. But again, going back to that first slide, that does, that does matter. Um, zero size vectors may have a cost. I tried it with GCC yesterday on O2, and it doesn't. But it can do. Something to watch out for. Um, standard function. Love standard function, except it allocates. That's annoying. Um, x86 has a stronger memory model than what C++ caters for. So you don't get a huge number of concurrency bugs on x86 compared to other platforms, but you pay for it slightly, which is annoying. Again, that's not C++'s problem, but it is a factor. And standard, con uh, sorry, the standard containers. Yeah, OK, we need to do slightly better in that respect for the really low latency stuff. The list goes on a little bit more, but you get the point. Um, so that cache warming that I was hand-waving and talking about earlier, I don't want to do that. Everyone does it. I want better mechanisms in the language that I use. That would be great. Um, process control, thread affinity, memory affinity. I want to allocate this memory on this CPU or on the memory bank closest to the CPU. I don't want it to go across NUMA nodes and things like that. It'd be wonderful if C++ could actually model not just threading, but actual processes as well. I don't want to write my own containers. I just, I just want them to be there. That would be great. Um, Inter-process communication, again, writing your own shared memory, message queues, single writer, single reader. Everyone does it. It's on the internet. Um, it would be great if they were in there. So this is what SG14 is aiming to do. Um, it's, uh, things are coming along, but yeah, it takes time. But I think eventually these things hopefully will be in there. If not, they'll be in a TS or something like that. Um, uh, incidentally, I've, when I mentioned that standard function uh, allocates, so uh, one proposal that SG14 is working on, um, which <laughs> is a in-place function. Um, I've got no idea if it'll get through or not. I hope it does. Um, but here, you can have something that looks a heck of a lot like a standard function. Uh, but you can at 
compile time, specify, if you want to, otherwise rely on the default, specify a buffer size, and that'll be just used in place. So if your standard, sorry, if your in-place function is on the stack, that buffer will also be on the stack. That will do your, that's where your capture will go. If your capture is too large for the buffer, you get a static assert. So no runtime costs at all. It's compile time detection of errors. Um, if it compiles, it will work, and if it'll work, everything will just be in line. You can pass those in-place functions around. You can copy them if you want to. Um, move supports there and all of that. Um, that's in the SG14 repo right now, if you want to uh, have a look. In fact, you can even use it. Um, it's basically a copy of something that we wrote at work. Uh, works fairly well. Need to add some more tests to it, um, but it's in a usable state already. Okay, so um, the summary. Yeah, really, it's all about low latency. It's not about doing a large amount of work. It's about doing a small amount of work fast, and that's very, very different from uh, most domains, and it's very different from what you'll get when you unwrap your server and you install the latest version of Linux or whatever it is. Where does the speed come from? It comes from primarily problem transformation, being smarter about the problem, converting it into a more optimizable form, really, really knowing C++ well, exploiting it, yeah, you need fast servers. You need fast networks. You're not going to get very far without that. Um, but luckily, that's what lots of people do, and they're good at it. Measure, measure, measure. Measure again. Super important. C++ definitely has some downsides. It's not obvious. Um, I do, I've started doing some Qt programming at home. I'm sure it's not super efficient, but it's fantastic for the stuff that I'm doing at home. I don't care about the latency. I just program like I need it, and it works. And it works really fast. But I'm sure that if I turn that into a trading system and then compete it with another company, it wouldn't hold there. Um, so yeah, it really is a different style of programming. You really need to basically get straight down into um, templates, get rid of those virtual functions. Um, it's really a different mentality. And in that line, that's where SG14 is coming in and doing a great job in my experience. So that's it um, for me. Um, questions? That's my email address if anyone wants to um, get some clarifications afterwards. Uh, that's the SG14 URL and the SG14 GitHub repo. The slides will be made available online after the conference, so the links to the um, uh, other things such as uh, the Veradic logging are there if you want to take a look as well. Right, thank you. Oh dear, Michael's got one. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, Hi. Uh, okay. You mentioned this packet capturing and measuring, uh, which is yep. fine to see end-to-end -end without obstru uh, obstructing your code. Yeah. Uh, but still, then you only know, okay, I made a diff, this has uh, changed this, and latency mm -hmm. seems to be affected like that. Um, yeah. But you don't really see what's going on in the whole chain of your code, which may be shorter or longer, depends. Yeah, you're right, yeah. So have you experienced or do you use any internal time stamping in the code and um, write it out later on or whatever? We do, yeah, we do use internal time stamping. It's a very good question. Um, and we notice that a lot of the uh, unexplained latency is actually in the inter-process communication. So everything within our components is pretty good. But then the timestamps don't add up, and the only thing missing is that inter-process communication. One side that I went over quite quickly is the profiling slide. Basically, if you've noticed a slowdown and you can't explain it by a code change, then it's time to get out the profiler and, and have a look and see what's, what's going on. Because maybe you are doing something a little bit odd. Like uh, an example was I actually was doing a system call at one point. I never realized it, but I was. I was sending out some UDP data. But it is a little bit flying blind in that respect. It's just a case of great, there's no slowdown, or great, there is a speed up. If not, then it gets a little bit harder. And it is a lot of guesswork. Um, yeah. Cool. Hey. Um, really great talk. Thank you. I think it's got, uh, judging by the room, I think they would agree that there's a lot of really useful bits of information here about how to get low latency in C++. I'm even more convinced now that um, that low latency has really aligned with SG14 very, very well, and there's a lot of proposal in there. Mm -hmm. Question 
do you use any lock-free programming techniques like the kind that I'm working on right now? I'm yeah. going to give a talk later on. Yeah. Because the whole point of it is that you that is that the advantage is that memory is cheap, but communication mm -hmm. is expensive, mm -hmm. and that's what I I, I I work on now. Yeah. Um, yes, mightily. So again, you're trying to keep your um, threading as minimal as possible. Right. But that doesn't mean that you don't have multiple processes or try to talk to each other. And yeah, uh, yeah, I'm. Across any boundary, it's always lock free. Okay. Um, and that's what I, I, I want to talk more about later on. Another yeah. question that was really interesting is you point out that microwave is really faster than fiber optics. And I understand that as a physicist, the refraction index in air is, significant, is actually a bit lower than in glass. But don't you get disruptions and short, isn't the range a lot shorter? How do you deal with the do you have any, does the network goes down? How yeah. frequently does it go down? I mean, are these no. problems for you? No, it's absolutely, it's absolutely perfect. It works in any weather. It go, no, it's terrible. No, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, geese can be a problem flying across line of sight. <laughs> With, <laughs> competitors, geese. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, microwave um, has lots of benefits and it has lots of downsides. And yeah, for sure, it's not reliable. And in fact, it's such a line of sight. Um, Weather, yeah, it comes into it for sure. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering about the algorithms yeah. um, you use because, like, black skulls or these options, any kind of options evaluation have some terms where you need to you think, okay, that's going to be very costly to evaluate. Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly, you have basically two strategies, and one is pre-computing as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And the other is basically coarsening the calculation by, let's say, uh, approximating mm -hmm. uh, a distribution with a lookup table. Do you uh, have any discussions with the risk management department that, oh, that I in, in change? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I mean, I, I mean I, I, there may be a sensitivity to the coarsening. And they're yeah. just saying, you're not representing uh, our models correctly. How do you deal with that tension? Yeah, boy, um, if I said that, you know, we could talk about optimization for a day, we could talk about risk for a month, I think. Um, no, you're right. Um, but most, uh, well, certainly our systems, we have very, very strong um, perimeter systems. So we really don't care that much about what internally the algorithms are doing. But those prices, when they're submitted to the market and those volumes better make sense. And that's through a completely external model that's not fast, but is accurate. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, and you're right. I mean, you can only interpolate and trade off so much before it's inaccurate, but it's not that. It's effectively trying to um, come up with an accurate model, well, a degree of accuracy that's super fast. Have lots of testing around it to make sure that it's OK have lots of monitoring in place to make sure that if it's not okay, it's caught, and then completely independent perimeter checks to make sure that if, for whatever reason, that price is slightly off, no more trading. Shut the system down. Pull the orders. It's a bit of a trade-off. Good question. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, there was, there's a project last year, I think, which is called Include OS. Have you heard okay. of it? No. Uh, oh, I Yes, yes, I have. No, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. it's like you can write directly. There's no kernel, there's yeah. no, nothing. Yeah. So I would please like to hear your comments on using that. Um, I haven't thought about it at all, except the day that I saw the talk, and I thought that is absolutely super cool. Um, I, there's got to be potential there, because, yeah, we're kind of going at it at the other angle, which is trying to bash our way through all the layers, whereas I've gone at it from a very, very simplistic Let's just have the absolutely minimal operating system that you want. And if you actually need a file system, link it in. You know, if you want networking, link it in. Um, yeah, super cool. But it's definitely worth something looking at. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at it. But yeah, that's a very good point. And who, who knows? Let, let's watch the space and see, see what happens. Hmm. Guys, we are over time, so I think yep. you can reach this.